Welcome to the Fighting on Film podcast, the podcast all about classic and obscure war movies, from the Normandy landings to the days of chivalry and swords. If it's been captured on film, we're going to try and cover it. I'm Robbie of RM Military History. I'm Matthew Moss of Historical Firearms and the Armourer's Bench. Hello everyone, welcome to Fighting on Film again. This week we're covering... Uh, Peter Watkins' nuclear war film, The War Game, from 1966. Me and Matt watched it together. Uh, I had never seen it before and was quite scared of watching it. And after we watched it, we recorded a quick Q&A with some of our initial thoughts. Uh, After that, we are going to talk about the film in more depth with a special guest, Julie McDowell, from the Atomic Hobo podcast. So I hope you enjoy. So Rob, you've just watched The War Game for the first time. Was it what you expected it to be? Um, yes and no. How so? So the thing is with this movie, I'd always, like there was, uh, I think it was 100 Greatest War Films on, on Channel 4, like years ago. Yeah, remember it. must have about 12, 15, something like that. The further they got along, the more movies, they clips they were showing. So I th- this might have come in like the top 20 or something. Um, and it was the bit with the, the eyes bit. Mm. And, I, and I think the clip they showed isn't the clip that I actually saw in the film. Like that was a bit that always scared me because I can't see out my right eye. So losing my vision is one of the things I don't like to think about. So do you think from that young age, you you kind of like created your own sort of impression of what the war game would be? Yeah, from that scene, I think it burrowed its way in and and my brain did the rest. Mm. But after seeing it, you know, it's it's an amazing piece of cinema by a director who knows what he's doing and, and knows how to show things that are, are harrowing and bad in a way that presents it to you in that matter of fact peter watkins way it, it, it will stick with me but i don't think it will stick with me like i thought it would mm. so you'd say you would say it was pretty much kind of what you expected in sort of like terms of tone and content imagery yeah, and style yeah, imagery and style yeah but then the bit that shocked me the most and i think it was just from a cinematic point of view was the the fire the firestorm scenes mm, mm. like that bit really got me because I was like that's really impressive like for a set piece of any film like is, is even a TV film it 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 really holds up those sequences in particular hold up quite well and even you know the bits at the start I didn't know there was preamble I thought it was all nuclear holocaust but it the preamble sets the tone in it makes sense in a way because it tells you everything that's going to happen and then it happens. And you're like, oh, they weren't bluffing. That's what got me. Then all the bit with the little kids, like the little kiddies holding their faces and stuff like that really got to me. Yeah, that final scene of of them, you know, being tended to and the civil defence people are stopping them from touching their bands and stuff. Mm. The bit where they ask the kids what they want to be in the future, it's very, very shocking stuff. Like, yeah. You can't you can't watch that and not think about the reality of no. what a nuclear war would have been or would be like. It's presented now like a thing that can't happen. Mm. But we've still got all the means to do it. Yeah. It's just not at the forefront mm-hmm. anymore. And I think that's the thing that's always that's the thing that's always scared me. You know, it's become one of those one of those things in, in my head that I've got a big innate fear of. And obviously everyone has. Yeah. But for me it's on like phobia levels almost. Mm. Like this is the first time I've ever, this is interesting because it's the first time I've ever watched anything about it in any depth. We had to coax you into it, really, didn't we? Yeah. Was there anything in the film that sort of, other than those bits you already mentioned, that really stood out and made you you think about what Watkins was trying to say? The, the bit with like, no one's prepared. Like you, you just can't prepare for it. And even if you do, you're not really done enough. It kind of says that, you know, even if they had evacuated people, it wouldn't have helped. No. It is a striking piece of cinema. I can see why the BBC didn't show it. Quite possibly would have been game changing, you know, for how Britain possibly approached the Cold War. I think it would have tapped quite a few heads. I think it would have made people really think about the reality of what they were enabling their governments to do on their behalf, you know, in order to like protect them. If you look at it historically, it's not pushing the envelope that far. No. And I think that's the thing that, that hits me the most. It's like, well, yeah. This could have happened. You know, the the BAOR would not have done one job against a a Russian shock army with ICBMs or anything like that. 
the country wasn't prepared because it just fought a war 15 years beforehand. This total war on another level. Yeah, exactly. You know, and then there's, you know, we try and do war films of a certain, a certain genre of war films. Schwarzbuckling, Poster Boy. We did The Great Escape a few weeks ago, like with McQueen and James Coburn in it. You know, there's no stakes in that film, really. It's just characters on a screen. But this is like proper documentary filmmaking and it it has its place in the genre and it's an important movie to tackle. Now I can say that I've seen it and I can put my prejudices to bed and maybe I can put some of my phobia to bed. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe it will help me in a men mental capacity going forward. Still feel a bit on edge, must admit. It's a powerful film. It does stay with you. I know that you were on a level where you, you know, you were worried it would manifest into some sort of like panic attack. It did a few weeks ago. I'm not not afraid to say I really found it hard to sleep that night. I, I had lots of imagery in my head that, that now after seeing the film, I know doesn't exist in the movie, which is really interesting in just the mental capacity. Yeah, I suppose what you've done there is you, your mind has taken, you know, all that imagery of, you know, a possible nuclear conflict and, and the aftermath. Mm. And it's combined it all in sort of like into an expectation of, yeah, you know, what a nuclear holocaust would look like, you know. Yeah. So you probably somewhere deep in there, you've got like the beginning of Terminator 2. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. No, you know, no. scenes from threads you might have caught in documentaries, yeah. you know, it's all yeah. sort of like percolated into this sort of idea of what a nuclear conflict might look like and the devastation, which I think everyone has, really. I think when you, when you ask people, all right, what do you think a nuclear war would look like? I think most people have that same sort of pure devastation in mind. Well, I assume people are only going off this or they're going off threads or they're going off of um, one of the World War Three documentaries from the 80s or 90s. When I was an undergraduate, I did um, a special module on uh, Cold War nuclear history. Mm. So I watched, I've watched a lot of sort of period documentaries where yeah. they've tried to sort of gingerly tell people what to expect or what how to prepare mm. and uh, you know and then i've seen other documentaries that are on the tv very often fairly obscure might have been shown once so even with you know that added sort of context that i have from having studied it in the past i still have this overriding sort of image of pure devastation I can't think of a better way of describing what would what it would be like. And I think Watkins is probably the first to try and present that in a realistic way. Because it's set in the real world so well, that's how it's not aged incredibly badly. Good. I just wanted to get your immediate sort of reaction. I had a beer on hand to sort of calm me down a bit. Steady the nerves, yeah. Dutch courage. <laughs> So following on there from Robbie's first impressions of having watched the war game for the first time, we're now very happy to be joined by Gillian McDowell, um, who is a, uh, a specialist writer when it comes to British nuclear history and culture. Uh, she's working on a book at the moment and she has the brilliant Atomic Hobo podcast. So Julie, welcome. It's so great to have you here. Thanks for asking me. Listeners will be aware it's the war game by the, the, the Peter Watkins, that, that grandfather of the, the docudrama format. Um, so this film comes out in 1966. It wins an Oscar for Best Documentary Feature. And it was something of a, like a bit like an anomaly because there isn't really any other films like this. You know, we've got threads, but then this film sort of stands out on its own as like a really unique piece of cinema. It's just, I think it's fascinating. And as someone who is terrified of nuclear war, I, mean, I guess we all are, it's absolutely shocking and it's stuck with me. I think it always does. I mean, as, as you mentioned, Ed, there are a few American films from the 50s that try and sort of talk about a, a possible atomic war or a third world war from the 50s but none of them are on the level of of the war game because they don't have that level of realism or or you know that pseudo documentary impact i also like that we can get away from the again it sounds very 1950s to talk about atomic warfare because once we get into what we see in the war game we're obviously then in the thermonuclear age yeah. which is a completely different world a uh, completely different there's you know no there can be no feasible talk of survival anymore once you're talking about thermonuclear war. So talking about atomic warfare, 
even though it's horrific, of course, or would be horrific, it almost sounds quaint when you compare it with mm. what the hydrogen bomb would have done to us or what it still could do to us. Unimaginable. Because that's the one thing they mentioned, don't they, during it, like when they shoot the, the when they fire the Honest John in at Berlin, um, you know, it goes, oh, that's that's the power of a Hiroshima bomb, but we're talking thermonuclear. And I was like, oh, hang on, there's worse ones? You know, I wasn't, I'm not really sure, I wasn't sure of any of this. So I was like, oh my God, you know, what the heck have they been doing? So yeah, I got some production uh, notes here and it was filmed for something between 7,000 and 12,000 pounds, which is nothing in in, 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 t- in film terms. You know, Peter Watkins' early films probably made even on not even a thousand pounds. So it's amazing what he does with the money that he gets. Narrated by Michael Aspel of the of uh, Antiques Roadshow fame, which I thought was quite funny. The thing with Michael Aspel, I think is the interesting thing, uh, and I think Julie mentioned this on on your uh, podcast about about uh, the war game, is that he's a household name at that point. He's been like a, a BBC news reader and presenter. When you sit down to watch the war game back in 66, if it had been broadcast, you would have sat down and then you would have instantly had this recognisable sort of expert voice. You know, he's a journalist, he's a news presenter, he, he's, you know, he's a household name. So it in, in immediately gives the film this sort of like credit credibility. Yeah, I think um, that's one of the ben- one of the strengths of, if we jump ahead to threads afterwards, uh, total realism or as realistic as you can get. They didn't opt for any big names or any big stars, mm. uh, which is where the director, Mick Jackson, thought the, the day after fell down. Well, mm. obviously it fell down in a lot of things. One of them yeah. was going for big stars, one of which, of course, was Steve Gutenberg. And who can take Steve Gutenberg seriously in a thermonuclear landscape? So, exactly. yeah, stripping it back to either unknown actors, as with Threads, or with the war game, Michael Aspel, who we know from, as you said, documentaries or news things, just adds to the realism and it just... The effect of it is just incredible, absolutely incredible. I can almost almost sympathise with the BBC for banning it. I can see why they might be worried about panic, but obviously, as we'll show they talk about later, there were probably some other pressures at play from the Home Office. It wasn't just a, a benevolent worry about nice little low deers watching it alone at home who might get worried by it. Yeah, totally. The no real characters thing, I, I wrote down in my notes, I put no real characters, and I think it's one of its strengths because... It's an every man sort of situation. It affects everyone. Doesn't matter if you're a big movie star or if you're like a, a, a janitor or, or a cleaner. If a nuclear bomb hits, that doesn't matter anymore. You know, it's a realistic setting, but it does feel like it's made for everybody. It's it's a really important piece of cinema making. And but to me as a viewer, even now, it, I think it hasn't aged at all. And it's got those sort of Peter Watkins beats. It's got those Vox Pops, the the way he treats his stock footage. So he go, puts it for a de-aging process that makes it look even older than it was. In an interview he gave in 1965, he said that we wanted it to feel like it had been pulled out of the archives 20 years later. And I think that's really interesting how he's trying to make something feel older, even though it was set in the 60s. When we think about the Vox Pops, um, I think obviously class was a big issue in Britain at that time. And he does, he seems to take care to, you get a mix of, posh voices and what, what would you think of sort of as maybe coarser working class voices mm. so again it, as you said earlier it, in every man aspect of it, it this could be any one of us and then um, all the money in the world can't protect you because it, I think they talked at one point about building your back garden shelter and how you would need money for that but even if you have money if you run to your local B&Q or hardware store everyone else is running there at the same point so the, the shelves have been stripped bare so all the money in the world can't protect you. Yeah, you get that fella, don't you, who's who's built two shelters and he goes, oh, and I've got this gun and shotgun and if they come near me, I'll, I'll give them what for sort of thing. And I'm thinking, mm, okay, like, I don't think those <laughs> little sandbags on your front window are going to do much. Um, you know, well, that's it's... what they were told. That is that is exactly what was in the civil defence pamphlets. And it was, it was the case right up until the, you know, the late 80s with Protect and Survive. It was the same sort of take a door off its hinges, put it up against a wall, pack it full of sandbags, and that's as good as it's going to get. The amazing thing about the war game is that everything it's saying doesn't really change over time. It says the information that Watkins is giving is pretty much as relevant now as it was then. So you know the way he talks about what a nuclear bomb can do at different ranges, all that kind of stuff was pulled from experts and pulled from you know, the civil defence um, atomic warfare pamphlets that were given to the civil defense and then also what was you know the, there's, a, there's a really interesting like, little scene where 
a, a woman answers her door to like a, an, an ARP or a civil defense warden and he hands her the little, you know, um, civil defense booklet. And the, the voiceover talks about how this had been available for a long time, but no one had really taken it because it cost five pence. So no one had bought the book. And I, I just think, you know, that's one of those sort of really interesting little little glimpses of, of what the culture around nuclear war was like. And the Vox Bops are interesting in that they sort of show the ignorance of people. So, you know, they're, they're asking questions about carbon-14 and strontium-90. And, you know, maybe one or two of them go, I'd heard of that, but, you know, they don't know what it does. So I think the war game does a really good job of sort of showing the ignorance of what the realities of thermonuclear war would look like. I think the ignorance um, also is maybe a form of like psychological protection, you know, convincing yourself that it can't possibly happen. Um, yeah. I know that when we look at stories from the Cold War of false alarms, when, you know, a faulty wire triggered a local siren, we have a lot of stories um, where locals heard it and they didn't all run screaming into the streets, but they would, they just a lot of them just turned over in their beds, went back to sleep. Uh, there's a famous case in Great Wakering in Essex, where the locals were at the pub at the time and they just stayed at the bar because, well, one, there's no point running into the street. You may as well stay at the bar and have a drink. But also there was just the thought that, well, it can't be real. It must be a false alarm. And of course it was because it's too horrific to think this is the last four minutes. I can't think of a better place to spend the last Yeah, just at the pub, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I know if I heard a siren just now, I know we're not connected anymore to the siren network, but if... I see I got a text message just now from the government's on off yeah. again scheme. I would just think it's it's a it's a hoax or it's a glitch. I wouldn't think oh okay, okay, four minutes left. Yeah. Yeah. My mind wouldn't let me understand that. It wouldn't let me perceive it as that. Mm. Uh, out of the blue, it wouldn't. If you were in a period of tension or if you know mm. the context changes yeah. it, but right now, if it happened, I would think it's obviously a mistake. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's a scary thing for me is that we think it's died down and all that. Obviously, it has over the, the years. You know, it's not at the forefront. It's still there. You know, it can still happen. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, it, that's always why it's been a thing I sort of shy away from and, don't, and have really been afraid of my whole life is because, one, I haven't I, – I had some therapy a few years ago. I have an innate fear of losing. So the, the nuclear war, I've been looking for back through my notes when I mentioned it, and she said, yeah, because if nuclear war happened, Rob, you'd lose everything. And I understand, I understand now why this film's been one I avoid, but now I'm happy that I've seen it in a sense, because now I can think, okay, like that wasn't actually as bad as I thought it was, you know, it's going to be awful anyway, if it ever happened, but at least I've seen something that puts it in a narrative perspective and I can appreciate it from its narrative points as well. Cause I think the whole alternative history thing that Pitt Watkins wrote rings quite true, you know, China could have come in and supported the Vietnam War. Berlin could have easily been blockaded off by the Soviets. They had the power to do it at any time during the... They'd done it before. Yeah, exactly. So it all feels real. And I think that's another great thing about the movie is it just it seems so real. So before we move into sort of the production side of things and then discuss the plot of the film, I, I think a little bit of like historical context would be good. So feel free to jump in here, Julie, because I'm sure you're far more knowledgeable about this than I am. But the UK's thermonuclear program began in 52 and sort of culminated with the Operation Grapple test series in 57, 58. So the war game basically came out almost a decade after Britain had become a thermonuclear power. Uh, yeah, and I think Peter Watkins is quite right in saying we had to bring it to wider public attention because um, I interviewed Mick Jackson a couple of weeks ago on my podcast that he'd said, and I wasn't aware of this until he's, until he's mentioned it, that Churchill, uh, when the thermonuclear age began, was very, very disapproving of any attempts to raise public awareness of it. And so that's why there was a kind of silence at the BBC over that, which Peter Watkins wanted to smash. And wow. he gave it his best shot. He gave it the best shot he possibly could. Too powerful. His attempt was far too powerful, far too frightening. And that's why it was silence, of course. But, yeah, there was a definite... I, th I, I think of it, as I said before in my podcast, as kind of a blitz hangover. We, with, with other, the help of others, of course, triumphed for the Second World War. And there's a nice warm folk memory of how we did it. Yeah. And the atomic bomb and the hydrogen bomb or thermonuclear bomb would shatter that nice warm folk memory. So all the austerity and hardship that Britain went through, of course, after the war, the fir their first taste of austerity after the war, 
that could that was at least I think maybe lessened the hardship of it was lessened by thinking well this is what we do this is how we pay for all the lovely success and the triumph of what we of what happened in the war this is a natural way of paying for it and it has to be done and then if the thermonuclear bomb had been made clear to us we would have lost that of course but well, what's the point of all this effort and hardship and austerity what's the point because if it happened again there would be no more rolling out the barrel and working together and rescuing people from the rubble it would all be absolutely hopeless mm. so i can see why they wanted to silence any truth about it but when I spoke to Mick Jackson, he spoke about this, this stain that this had left on the BBC by silencing the war game. It left a terrible stain on the BBC because it was silencing the truth, of course. Mm. And I, I can see why the government were horrified by it, because if you do learn the truth of what a thermonuclear bomb will do to you, then there's no point in civil defence. And arguably, there's no point of the deterrent either. So everything falls apart. It's like pulling the rug completely from beneath the feet of the British government. So I can see why there was a bit of panic when the war game popped up. But I hope Peter Watkins yeah. now can be smug and proud of what he did because he's been proved right a thousand times over. Yeah, yeah. That's one of my things I said after I first watched it. I think I said during, uh, there's a scene I'll mention later, but it, it got me really, like it's the thing that in my head that formed my fear of watching this film. But I said, look, I'm CND. But I'm doubly. So how could you not be CND after watching this? You know, it's it's shocking. If anyone comes away from this movie thinking nukes are damn good, they're wrong. You know, it's just I'm, I'm sorry, but I don't know how you can form a pro nuclear stance after something like watching this. It's it's crazy. So every week I go off to the archives and I try and find a, a newspaper article or a review um, about the movie that we're featuring. So this week's retro review comes from the Reading Evening Post from the 19th of April 1966. If you are among those who thought that it needed the comedy nightmare approach of Dr. Strangelove to bring the full horror of nuclear war home to us, then you are in for a harsh corrective when you see The War Game by director Peter Watkins. A blinding flash, a roar that shatters the eardrums. Everything turns into a bizarre photographic negative. Buildings crumble and a small boy shrieks as his eyes are burned away. The horror has begun. Fifty minutes later comes the announcer's parting shot. There are 30 tonnes of high explosive for every man, woman and child on the planet. From start to finish, the war game offers not a whiff of hope. It spurs the possibilities of a so-called clean nuclear bomb. It derides a theory that humans will drag themselves out of the debris and start again, as they did with the wartime blitzes. And that's a fairly balanced review for the period as well, isn't it? And it goes on and it ends with clearly Mr. Watkins film is a howl of personal protest against Britain's completely unpreparedness for an atomic attack and against the conspiracy of official silence, which has surrounded the whole possibility of such a catastrophe happening. One can only hope that the terrible echoes set up by the war game will batter against the con consciences, sorry, of the men who hold out our destinies in their hands from this point of view. It's the most important film ever made. I would agree. It's the most important film ever made. Um, only surpassed by Threads, which came later. But Threads, of course, wouldn't have existed without the war game. So mm. that all stems from, from Peter Watkins back in the 60s, certainly. Yeah, and that's the thing I found when I was finding these reviews. Every single review, there was no... There were a few that were like, I don't like the movie for some of its technical points, but none of them were saying that they didn't like the movie for its subject matter. And I found that quite refreshing, that no one at the time was going oh, this is, you know, this is good stuff, you know, this is what we're going to do to the Ruskies, you know, no one's saying that, which I was really pleased of, because I thought in my head somehow that all the major publications would be like, great, let's do this to Moscow, but luckily they're not. In 1971, Alan Rosenthal um, interviewed Peter Watkins for a book on, you know, um, on cinema making and documentary making, etc. It's called New Documentaries in Action. Thank you. And basically, he explains sort of like the genesis of where the idea came from which I think is really interesting because we mentioned CND there. And he says, well, back in 1961-62, like most people in, in England, I was an observer of the campaign for nuclear disarmament. I felt very strongly about the issue, but I didn't choose to join the campaign because although I agreed with their objectives, I disagreed with their strategy, which I thought was interesting. You know, he's been thinking about this for at least five years. And mm. he goes on to explain that his original plan was to do a smaller amateur piece. So this is before he became 
um, linked with the BBC, you know, before Culloden that he made uh, a couple of years earlier. And he, he says the original idea was to be shot in a cellar where he would do face-to-face interviews with um, survivors and, you know, they'd recount what they'd seen in the moments before they, you know, they got into the shelter of the, of the cellar. I love that idea. It's really good. Isn't that a great idea? That's a film I would love to see. And I, you, you kind of get a little bit of that with Mick Jackson's threads, you know, where um, the council workers are stuck in the, in the bunker and they're trapped in there and they, you know, there's a little bit of discussion. But with Watkins' is, you know, unique sort of uh, tight close-up interview sort of style, I think that would have been really effective. Yeah. Maybe not as effective as, you know, the war game, but I think it would have been, you know, like a really interesting amateur film along the lines of Forgotten Faces. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that might have been even more powerful considering what he does with the micro budgets that he has anyway. You know, it's sort of, it could have been something, it, but... I think it would have definitely been pretty harrowing. Oh, gosh, you know, yeah. With the right actors and actresses, I think it would have been... Mm. Well, if, it done, if he'd done it with a Playcraft film unit, um, then he definitely would have got what he wanted. Because um, if you've not, anyone's not seen The Forgotten Faces or um, Diary of an Unsol- Unknown Soldier, they're, they're great works. You know, you, you want to see a through line of Watkins' work up to this. Start with those because it's just everything gets better and more technical. He becomes a better filmmaker, refines his work, and then you get the war game, which for me has to, is his magnum opus. It has to be. Watch it in the daytime. It's not a nighttime film. <laughs> So the plot is is interesting. Um, we've already mentioned that um, China invades South Vietnam against the US forces there. Um, and they, the US, in, in response, threatens to use tactical nuclear weapons. The USSR then says that they'll blockade uh, West Berlin. And if uh, the US don't remove that threat of, you know, battlefield nuclear weapons, then they will, they will forcibly take West Berlin. And that's sort of like the, the point where everything devolves into this inevitable nuclear war. So um, we, the UK declares a state of emergency and we get a fascinating look at how the government sort of planned to deal with a nuclear crisis. Um, so we get a look at the evacuation plans, the civil defence stuff, um, and you know the, all the impacts that that would have caused. And then the second act basically shows the beginning of the nuclear war. So we, you know, we, we get people readying their, you know, their shelters or you know, trying to buy supplies. And then the, the attack happens. Um, and we get those really powerful scenes of the young boy being blinded and, you know, the, the family in panic because they try and move a table around, you know, the, those kind of scenes. And then we get the firestorm scene, which I think we'll talk about later. Um, and then the third act is basically the aftermath, isn't it? And it, it looks at how they would deal with the wounded, food shortages, um, missing persons. We get all those really powerful scenes of, you know, the euthanasia of the wounded how they would deal with uh, you know, the copious amounts of dead. Um, and then, you know, we end on this really powerful scene with, uh, with the children, you know, and they talk about what their hopes are for the future and the silent night gets played on a broken gramophone. And it's the perfect ending to the film in that it underlines everything that he's tried to get across. Well, if we're talking about memorable scenes, um, obviously, as you said, the firestorm, which we'll talk about, but, um, Another one of my favourites, and my favourite, I mean, the most horrifying is, of course, the one uh, in the clinic or in the hospital uh, where we see the, the GP who has had to turn his hand to makeshift surgery, I suppose, talks about holding, holding, uh, holding cell, not holding cells, how does he phrase it? Holding area, that's it, holding area. And then that's basically those who are beyond help, or at least beyond the very, very limited medical help that's now on offer, will be left to die. And that sounds, of course, horrific. It sounds, it sounds almost as though Peter Watkins is exaggerating. Mm. Whereas we know better than that. We know that firstly he wouldn't do that, but secondly we know from research that it's true. Up until the end of the Cold War, Britain was planning for its NHS to have these holding areas where, if you were injured and you weren't, uh, you weren't able to be uh, repaired or cured with a quick fix you would be left to die, which is almost impossible to comprehend. We think how reliant we all are on the NHS and how fond we all are, all are of the NHS. We've seen that, of course, with COVID, with the doorstep clapping and applauding yeah, and yeah, yeah. saving the NHS, instead of protecting the NHS, rather. And yet that same NHS would be forced to leave you to die without even a paracetamol, without even the most basic thing. And that's what always strikes me, the thing. The NHS has always been there for us. Those of us who, were, of course, were born after the, after the war, it's always been there. If you're in any kind of 
pain or discomfort or distress, you simply pick up the phone and you dial 999 and help is there for you. And that is completely gone in a nuclear war. And the most basic pain relief, the most basic antiseptics, everything is gone and you're left to die in this holding area. And um, it's the most horrific thing. And I've been in archives, as I'm sure you guys have, and I've seen these, these plans printed out on paper and they were real and it was going to happen to us. And it still could, of course, if it ever does happen again. You could be tossed aside and left to die in pain with nothing and no one to help you. And you get one of those Peter Watkins uh, trademark close-ups that linger just a little bit too long to make you start like wriggling around in your seat. Um, and there's a there's a, a guy with a blanket and he's got obviously half his face has been burnt to burnt to you know kingdom come and he just he's just looking at the camera and you think Jesus you know it's like yeah. that poor man and you have you have that GP who's just a GP he's not he's not like a, a trauma specialist he's just a GP and he's there trying to cope with this influx of human suffering mm. likes of which no one can ever even really comprehend and the voiceover is talking my glass was talking about those of 50% or more burns on, across their bodies will be left to die. Yeah. And the, the doctor then uh, he basically ends is a little piece of camera. He's, he's, you know, asked to explain what's going on. And he, he talks about how they'll be begging him to, you know, put them out of their misery. Mm. And then we cut to that sort of that scene that a lot of people like link into, into the movie or re remember from the movie is the, the scene of the policeman being armed to, you know, put people out of their misery. Yeah. And it's that, you know, you've got that safety blanket at the NHS and it's been like, it's been ripped out from under you. Mm. And can you imagine the impact of that when you, you know, you're sat at home on a Saturday evening watching BBC two mm. and, you know, or one where it was going to be broadcast on. And, you know, you, you're used to that safety blanket of the, you know, welfare state and the NHS and everything, your medical needs are looked after. And as you said, Julie, that's gone in an instant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it, I'm, we're gonna, we're gonna, we'll talk about it at the, at the end about, you know, the impact that this film could have had if it had been shown. But I think that would have been in one of the moments where everyone went, Christ. Oh, no. like, yeah. Terrifying. You know, yeah. We would, why, why would we accept this as a possible future? You know, That's exactly my thoughts, you know, it, all the way through it. And Matt, me and Matt was there with me watching it, holding my hand sort of thing. He was like, you know, <laughs> I was, I screamed. I, I literally not, like exclaimed, I was like, how can you do this to your fellow man? How can you think this is acceptable? And that's the whole, the thing throughout for me. I mean, the scene that got me and it, it's, this is, I'm going to go way back now. <laughs> but um, I think it was like 2005, Channel 4 did 100 Greatest War Films and there was only one nuclear war film that made the list. It was number 63 and it was When the Wind Blows. I haven't seen it. I don't think I could put myself through it after watching this. Um, but during it, I, I can't remember exactly, but they either played a clip from the war game to showcase other nuclear war films. And it's the scene where the GP gets out of his car and they go into the, the guy, woman's house um, to check on the, the sick lady. And then the bomb drops. And you get the scene of the people holding their eye, holding their faces when the flash goes off. And it's the line of, um, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but it's the line that goes, you know, that the, the flash is powerful enough to melt the eye wall or something like that. It bur buried itself in my head, that line, for years and years and years. And I, um, until two weeks ago, I'd never seen that clip again um, for 15 years. And, I, and it, it's one, it scares me because I, can't see out of my right eye so losing my sight is one of the things i just don't think about but to then have <laughs> have a bomb designed that can just take your vision like that so quickly is so striking and then it's all the scenes with the kids holding their eyes and the family hiding it's i've just recently had a baby so i'm like oh my god you know everything's been ramped up since watching the film that scene for me is so it's so important for me as a person because it sort of molds my view on conflict and war. You know, I'm, I'm really interested in it, but then I'm really anti it as well. So there's this whole parallel with my sort of personality where I'm like, learning about it is really, really interesting, but God forbid we ever have to do it. And, and, this, and I now know why this movie is so important to me now afterwards. And that, that's the scene for me that is the most shocking. Yeah, when we talk about what the nuclear bomb can do to the eyeball, it's almost as if 
this thing must have been designed by by Satan. It's just it's so horrific. Exactly. I remember reading the first time I'd come across the idea of what it could do to the eye was in the book Hiroshima by John Hershey. And he uh, tells the story of a, a German priest who had survived Hiroshima. And wow. in the aftermath, he's running through the city and he sees a, cl- a group of soldiers and they're all gathered together. They're all huddled behind a bush. And they, I, I think they, they cry out to him. They hear him running past and they cry out saying, what's happened? And he looks down at them and he's... Uh, and again, I can't remember the exact wording, but basically the, the whole group of soldiers, their eye sockets are empty. Oh and the God. German priest says they must have been looking upward when the bomb burst in the sky. And so they don't know what's happening is, and they never will because they're, they're, it's, it's, it's like a horror film. Yeah. Their eye sockets are empty. Their eyes have liquefied. Someone corrected me once on my Facebook page because I said that it can melt the eyeball and they uh, corrected me, no, no, it liquefies the eyeball. So the eyeball Jesus. had liquefied and trickled down the face and that that's oh it that, that's what it does and it's almost beyond horror uh, when I was pitching my my book to various publishers I had been I think quite dignified in what I was writing you know trying to write a proper somber history of of uh, preparation for nuclear war and one publisher said don't be afraid to put more horror into it because I'd tried to I think err on the side of caution he said no don't be worried about that as long as it's the truth of course throw yeah. in all the horror you can why not so I've now put in details about that, even though they sound as though they were made for like some kind of horrible, over-the-top, ridiculous 18 certificate Hollywood film. This is the reality of nuclear war. As Michael Aspel says in the film, this is nuclear war. That's all you have yeah. to say. This is the reality of it. You know, it's, like, it's almost like something out of one of those video nasties from the 80s, but it, it's real. Julie, for you, is it a scene you particularly want to highlight? I think the scene... I know we're going to talk, you said earlier, we talked about the firestorm scene, but there's one moment during the firestorm scene where Michael Aspel says, again, in his very, very subdued, matter-of-fact manner, that the, that the firemen are trying to put a fire, I think it's in a car, and in this car, a family are burning to death. Yeah. And yeah. again, this happens in When the Wind Blows, I know you haven't seen it yet, but there's a, a moment where the bomb drops and you see various scenes across the country, various ways of meeting your death. And there's one scene where you see a train racing through the lovely green, soft English countryside and the blast I should knock so derail the train and the train just plunges, I think, off a bridge or something. So all those people on that train, I think, if they'd imagined what would nuclear war be like, you imagine blasts and fire. You don't imagine I'll be on a train and we'll plunge off a bridge into a river. So there are a million different ways that nuclear war can kill you. Uh, again, in threads, when the bomb drops, we see a car veer off the road. Again, probably the driver blinded by the flash, and it smashes into a wall. And so we assume, okay, that's him gone. So he, the nuclear war killed him via a car crash. So there yeah. are a thousand different ways. And this family are burning to death in their car. Yeah. And just that really got to me. Like, there are a hundred million different ways nuclear war will get you. All mm. of them horrific. There's no nice way it can kill you. There's no drifting off to sleep and dying peacefully in your sleep. There are so many ways and every one of them is absolutely horrific. So that really got me, that very matter-of-fact delivery from Michael Aspo, yeah. that yes, in this car, a family are burning to death and that's all there is to it. It's even more shocking because then it just cuts to the firemen doing their job because the it's almost, it's filmed in a way where like, there's nothing they can do for them. You mm-hmm. know, they're gone, they're gone, as of, I'm, I'm afraid, sort of that very news really way of doing things where it's like, here's what's happening, here's the next thing. It's like, because in the chaos of that firestorm like yeah okay you could get you could maybe put the car out but by the time you do it what's happened down the street you know how many more people are going to lose their lives it's sort of it's damage limitation isn't it by these firemen and but you know you say it's damage limitation but you, you, then you have that realization that everything within that scene is useless yeah because they're all they're all radiated they're all going to die anyway mm-hmm. you know, mm. it's those layers of sort of like Christ, these people have got no chance whatsoever. Yeah. So it talks about um, some of the firemen have been killed by falling debris. Some of the firemen have already succumbed to heat stroke and asphyxiation. 17 of the 60 firemen have already yeah. died by there the end go. of the bit. Um, and then we get those really powerful scenes of the of the firemen like trying to crawl into a building and they just asphyxiate right there in front of you. They just, they're gone. Yeah. And that just writhing scene, on the ground, trying to breathe. Because that and that whole sequence is just that, that's the for from a filmmaking aspect, that is incredible. 
It's the kind of thing you wouldn't expect to see made. The way they did it was they they had fans near the camera and then they would get packets of flour and little bits of debris and they would chuck them in. And the way they got people to look like they were getting swept off their feet, they had two mattresses just out of shot. And Peter Watkins said, this is in the interview that you found, Matt. Yeah. Um, not well, steal. I just read a bit first. Yeah, so I don't want to steal from your <laughs> notes. Um, we do it a lot. Um, <laughs> but they said, look, when you feel, it's really hard to, he said, to make them feel like when the wind hits you from the fan, then you've got to jump. And hopefully the wind will have a, from the fan will have enough um, power to send you into the mattress portray that it's taking you which they do really really well yeah because they were going to have people on wires and Watkins said no because didn't want to hurt the people um but then yeah and then he said we just either tilted the camp tilted the frame slightly so it, it looked better or if the person did it fantastically then we did it like that but when you watch it <laughs> it's like is that how is that flower how is that just a bit of random bit of shredded up paper so they built up fire behind um, windows with with um, phosphorus magnesium flares, flares, magnesium flares. So you get the yeah. white smoke, you know. And then, oh my god, the scene of the people getting out of the Austin Austin ambulance. Yeah, because it must be hotter in there than it. I I'm just and then they just sit down and I'm like, oh my god, you know what the hell? Like it's just it's a beggar's belief. I'm just like those poor people getting into an ambulance it shouldn't be death. It should be like the savior moment. And I'm like. Well, oh my god, nothing nothing is right. Nothing will be the same after this scene. It's just like, you know, there's no hope. There's just no hope. Sorry to get all sort of uh, emotional, but it's just I don't know any other response. <laughs> but that's I agree with you completely. There's no hope if, if if that is how it turned out. Yeah. I know I know the war game the war game ends relatively quickly after the bomb drops, but I know I keep going back to threads. I'm, I'm fine. obsessed with no, threads. I don't think you can talk about the two without talking about the other. That's right, the yes, other. yes. But of course, threads, for those who've seen it, um, threads leaps ahead into the next generation, and th- th- that's total horror. Uh, society is has completely lost any sense of civilization. Even language is gone. The, the children have been born after the bomb don't even know how to speak properly. Yeah. And so even if you were able to physically survive the bomb, I, my thoughts and research and thinking always comes back to the same depressed question, but why would you want to? That's just my yeah. personality, perhaps, but why? I wouldn't want to survive that. No. No. And that's one of the great strengths and threads. It's brave enough to leap forward into the next generation, and I would just I would just turn my head away from it. I would just say, no, thank you. And, of course, yeah. the main character in Threads, Ruth, if you ask that question of her, why does she keep getting up and keep existing? We assume it's because she has a daughter. She has to keep going for the purpose of her daughter. But um, otherwise, you would just lie down in the dirt and, and give up, I think. When you look at sort of popular culture and nuclear war, you get the Fallout games. And I'm like, nah, <laughs> it's complete bollocks, I'm afraid. You know, it, you can enjoy them, but I'm thinking that better not be what people think it's going to be like, you know, putting your vault suit on and going and collect some tin cans to make that weapon. It's like, nah, it's not going to be like that, I'm afraid. If that's one thing that those games and stuff have done, it's trying to make it all be rosy right after. I'm like, no, not after this. You know, not after. That's a very dangerous point of view as well. You could say, oh, it's just a game. It's just pop culture. You know, I was talking to an American guy on. He emailed me yesterday. He was formerly watching uh, U.S. Air Force with nuclear security, and he said he thinks, and a lot of his colleagues and. Uh, peers think the same. A lot of Americans, I'm sorry if I'm insulting any Americans here, but a lot of Americans think they would survive a nuclear war because the huge landmass of America and they're all, you know, a lot of them are armed to the teeth and the prepping community is so widespread there that they think it it wouldn't be that bad. Mm. And of course, things like the Fallout games almost give it a bit of a a cheeky little adventurous spirit. Like, uh, let's see, pit your wits against the bomb and see if you can survive. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's dangerous. And then added to that, we have, I don't know if you've read the new book about the Cuban Missile Crisis and Nuclear Folly, but that ends with a, an epilogue about the rise of, or rather the rejuvenation of tactical nuclear weapons and modern technology will make them far more precise. And that will make nuclear war again, we've been through all this, of course, in the 80s, make nuclear war seem survivable. We can use a few little small tactical nukes to target, not a city, not even an area of a city, not even a street, but some compound or some guy's house or something, we can zoom in that closely. And so therefore it rips away the, the nuclear taboo. 
it makes nuclear weapons seem usable and almost desirable, which is the yeah. most hideously dangerous thing I can imagine. We must think of them all. We must lump them all together. I think the tiniest little tactical nuke should be considered as unthinkable as exactly. the most grotesque yeah. thermonuclear warheads. I think that's one of the things that the war game does really well. It sort of like shows that domino effect that yeah. you could go from a limited nuclear engagement to full scale thermonuclear mm -hmm. war in minutes, yeah. hours. Mm -hmm. You know, it's because even the bit where I think it's halfway through where they're, they're it's got worse as it's going to get sort of thing for the the poor people in the movie, and Aspel just goes, "Oh well, the, the V bomber force have, have cracked the Russian air defences and they've just dropped their counter value target bombs." And then I'm thinking, it doesn't matter now. It doesn't matter, I don't care. And we get those great sort of like interviews with members of the cast where it's their real opinions. They aren't scripted. Yeah. It's they're in the cast, obviously. Mm. But he just, Watkins has just asked them the questions that, you know, they would have been asked because you've probably seen some of them, Julie. Like the, I remember when I did my uh, undergrad, I did a module on nuclear history and culture. And I watched these brilliant ITV sort of um, on the street interviews where it was done for like evening news sort of thing. And they were talking about CND and, and all this kind of thing. And they look exactly the same. You know, it's the same and you're getting the same sort of responses from people like, oh yeah, we should retaliate because, you know, they've done it to us. It's an eye for an eye, that kind of thing. And, yeah. and people, almost all of the people that Watkins asks in that bit go, yeah, we should drop the bomb because it, and one lady says it's, you know, it's a cyclical thing. And that's that sort of like nuclear inevitability of once we're in this, it's going to happen yeah. and everyone's going to suffer. I don't see the point in retaliation at all. No, it's, no. it's absolutely pointless. If you are thinking of survival long term, then the Russians will be the ones who will be coming along to, to help you. So if you do retaliate, all you're doing is killing off any any prospect of aid further mm. down the line. I know there's a whole better, better dead than red thing, but mm. there's no point to retaliation. I, I see the point. In the terrorists, of course, whenever a new labor leader comes along, the media always love asking him, so would you press the button? And when yeah. the poor guy yeah. says, well, yes, because, of course, that's the game. He has to say yes. Yeah. Everyone loves to tear him apart on Twitter saying he would kill all the babies. That's not the point. He's trapped. He or she is trapped, whether they like it or not, in the game of the terrorists. You have and to if say you, If you say yes, you're you not going to do it, then you're weak. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> you can't win you know, at all. You know, you're actually weak for having some moral fibre and not wanting to kill hundreds of millions. You know, it's bizarre. So um, we've got a bit down in the dumps, uh, <laughs> a bit bogged down in the in disaster syndrome of our very own on the pod today, unfortunately. So I think maybe we should rescue ourselves from the debris and talk about some honourable mentions because we can't do the alley tally because it's a bit morbid this week. So anyone's got any sort of more jovial points they want to make, <laughs> now's the time. Julie, you're the guest if you've got anything. I think, okay, if we want to be jovial and poke fun at something, I think what we've talked about was the war game. We've talked about it's low budget, a relatively low budget. Yep. And again, Threads, my obsession, was the same, extremely low budget. And if we compare these two brilliant nuclear war films to mm -hmm. the laughable The Day After, the American nuclear war film from 1983, mm -hmm. they had a relatively large budget. I think it was about $7 million. And it's a, it's a silly film. It's silly, it's quite trite it's quite it trivializes nuclear war it has steve gutenberg in it which of course trivializes it yet again <laughs> um so i just can't take him seriously in a disaster no, it's, film. Almost, it's impossible really yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just, yeah. yes. so um, maybe there's a lesson here in uh, budget maybe if you have a large budget with a nuclear war film you maybe feel tempted or pressured to spend it all on the big stars or the big special effects whereas when we look at Peter Watkins and Nick Jackson, who were constrained, perhaps, by the budget, they were forced to be creative. And thank God they were, because they gave us such brilliant films. So loads of money and Steve Gutenberg just ain't going to do you much good if you want a realistic, hard-hitting nuclear war film. Very true. Yeah. I mean, regardless of the budget, I think what Watkins achieves with the film is phenomenal. I mean, he gets so much impact out of the most simple things, like... There's, there's a scene where the food truck arrives in the street and there's a man just sat on like a wooden deck chair in the street yeah. looking so despondent as you would. 
and you just think, Christ, can you imagine being that man in that street at that moment? Yeah. You've survived a nuclear war. And then, you know, a couple of police arrive and put down two tiny boxes of food for the whole street. Yeah. That scene would have cost nothing to shoot. The, the fire the fire um, storm scene was shot in a, uh, an old barracks in, mm. in Dover that was, you know, going to be knocked down. So they had those buildings. And that was just a, a simple terrace street that was shot on. It was just a man sat outside a house. Mm. But it was so impactful. Yeah. I think the, the scene that is kind of a little bit funny to me when you think about it in like a dark humor sort of way, you know, there's a, there's a food riot and an attack on a, like a, a local government depot, isn't there? And, you know, it cuts to this housewife and she's just stood there behind a chain link fence in the background. There's a couple of dead bodies of the guards that have been overpowered by, you know, food rioters. And she's just stood there next to like a, a couple of tans, cans of um, spam or like carnation milk or something on the floor. Yeah. See that merging into a Monty Python sketch yeah, very easily. You can, can't you? Yeah. <laughs> it's just, and it's a scene that you can completely imagine happening because yeah. everyone wants to survive at that point. Housewife or not, she's going to be trying to get food. And she's there in this most surreal situation. And she's just got this completely sort of like, I, I don't yeah. know, sort of like bomb happy, I suppose, would be the World War II term where she's just like in complete sort of like dejection and shock. Yeah. But it's just such a surreal scene to see those, you know, like brand names on the floor, on the tins of food. It's just, yeah. That's one of the scenes that jumps out at me. I think it trivializes everything, doesn't it? Yeah, I suppose it adds that extra level of like the humanity to it. But for me, I mean, the, the bits that I sort of found humor in, it's the wrong word, to, um, was there's an American professor and he's going off about like, atomic oh, fission. yeah he's very optimistic about very the like optimistic. what's gonna happen isn't he but he's a dead ringer for john thompson's denzel dexter character from the fast show and it, it's just we watched a few it's clips of him today and it's just like and the nuclear fission will do this and that you think you keep <laughs> you know you keep thinking john thompson's gonna just like come out and sort of start <laughs> chatting with him because he cited like those sort of professors from the open university with the inspiration for that so I wonder if he watched the war game and was like, I'm going to base a character on that. There's definitely room for black humour, though, if you're definitely. talking about nuclear war preparations and defence. Um, I, I, if I can give you one tiny anecdote, sure. in, in the archives down at Kew, I found um, a, a big uh, folder about you know civil servants from the 50s discussing disposal of the dead. And uh, there was a tiny little memo, handwritten in lovely uh, you know, calligraphy, as we used to write in the old days. Uh, and it said... Um, must we speak of disposal of the dead? Wouldn't um, what was oh god, I've forgotten the term he used now. He, he took offense to the term disposal, he used a, a more polite alternative because he thought, Isn't disposal a bit harsh? And I just laugh at the thought of all these civil servants saying, Oh, maybe, maybe it would be a bit unpleasant, you know, in the greatest horror that could ever befall humanity. They're worried about the terminology. I, I can, I've completely forgotten what the alternative term was that he. That he volunteered but is disposal not a bit harsh we're talking about you know our fellow brits here like gentlemen should we use and i can't remember the term he used but in his lovely calligraphy handwriting he offered an alternative to disposal of the dead surely the word dead is the troublesome word there <laughs> yeah, not yeah. disposal true but um yeah so there's there's room to, to laugh at this all the, all the time um and maybe that's all you can do because mm. when you're planning for nuclear war these civil servants must have known that so much of it was futile but um I think I've said Definitely. before in my podcast, planners going to plan. They've got to. Yeah. That's their job. You True. know, they have to go home at the end of the day and say, okay, yeah, I planned for nuclear war today. If they're not doing that, then, you know, they're not doing the job. So who can blame them? But mm. it is ludicrous. There is a lot of black humour in it if you're willing to look for it. And there's, a, I think, another thing that the film should be heralded for is the fact that it's probably one of the only narrative depictions of the BA, British Army on the Rhine, the BAOR, in film. Because um, there, there's hardly any depictions of them actually doing their job which was defending the the Rhineland. Um, so to see them fighting off a, a Soviet like motor, motor division is quite interesting, just from a film point of view. Um, and the Honest John. And the Honest John. That's really yeah. Bedford based on a Bedford truck, guys. We couldn't do another yeah. episode of fighting on film without getting a Bedford mention. Um, <laughs> there's actually a Bedford OB bus when um, the little, unfortunately, when the little kiddie gets himself blinded when his mum and dad come to collect him away in the background there's a little bed for oh yeah of course yeah, I'm, yeah. yeah I know the scene that was nice to see you know in the horror and despair if i saw a bedford rolling down the road with tin cans on the back i'd be like 
here come the boys in their beddies to sort us out. No, I probably, <laughs> probably wouldn't even be thinking that. Um, Matt, there's a Mark 1 Sten. There is. Yeah, yeah. That is an interesting little inclusion. I think it's really interesting all those scenes where this sort of civil defence aspect comes in and, you know, they see policemen who typically in Britain, we don't arm our police. And I think that's another layer of showing what the reality of this, you know, how far it's gone conflict yeah. is going to look like you know you've got armed police famously in thread you have the armed traffic warden um that everyone talks about iconic um, oh, yeah, exactly. very iconic um, even if you haven't seen the film you probably know what the quote about him and in in the war game it's no different so you've got like um the police are handed out revolvers and you know there's a mark one sten which you, i think it's a mark one star star isn't yeah. it yeah and like in 633 squadron yeah, yeah they're very rare it's it's very jarring to see that classic sort of british bobby and his you know his helmet and his, his his great coat being handed a weapon or like loading a rifle mm. and then there's that shocking scene towards the end of the film where food writers that had you know stolen food killed police officers are summarily shot by police officers yeah and at that point had we had we by 66 were we still executing people or who'll be moved i can't remember we'd stopped the by then we'd stopped I by then so which again is you know that's another thing that summary execution of capital mm. punishment brought, mm. brought, brought back you know because the situation was so you know <laughs> alien from what we know it's Definitely. just it's another one of those and the amazing thing that watkins does throughout the film is he punctuates all that horror with the moments of oh god this really is you know beyond our comprehension because all yeah. of these things are happening the amount of research you must have done to to gather all that minutiae of sort of like elements that make it such an interesting film and get across all that information it just it's really impressive when you think about it very much so i was going to say talking about law and order and um, i discussed that in my in one of my podcast episodes then um, how the police or the authorities whoever ends up in charge after the nuclear war would have to find new ways or bring back old ways of punishment because yeah. the current one, for example, jail, <laughs> after the nuclear war, jail might actually be seen as a reward. You know, we're going to put you in a nice big secure building which the fallout can't penetrate and we're going to give you three meals a day and a, a bed. A bed and meals and protection sounds yeah. great. It's like a luxury after the nuclear exactly, war. So these yeah, things yeah. are no longer a punishment. You can't find people because money might have no meaning anymore. So arguably you do need to go look back to things like execution or putting people in, in the stocks. Um, I found that in the archives, uh, they would bring back what they called um, exposure to public disapproval as a punishment. And that sounds oh very sinister because to me that implies right there, throwing them to the mob. Yeah, let, let, the, let the mob uh, issue their own justice. Yeah, but like I, I, I was thinking after, like, what could you do that's worse? You know, <laughs> yes. no, who's going to be annoyed at you for nicking a can of food? You know, like, I mean, exactly. I mean unless it's beggar's belief how you can sort of think of a worse way to be punished than being exposed outside to all that radiation <laughs> it's just like oh my god um so maybe that brings us into final thoughts territory i think One thing I wanted to dis discuss with you, Julie, was the the aftermath of the film and how it it never actually came to the public fore. And you did a, a great podcast, I think it was a year or so ago, I, I can't remember, um, but I listened to it again the other day, and I think Rob has as well. And you talk extensively about, you know, the Home Office backlash and how the film was sort of suppressed. Peter Watkins, as you know, was a you know brilliant young director. The BBC were quite keen to see what else he had to offer, so... And again, Mick Jackson told me this. Um, I haven't done this research myself. Mick Jackson said, the BBC said to him, OK, nuclear war film, uh, it would be a bit of a you know a departure from what we usually do. But go off and do your thing and we will you know, tentatively give it our blessing. But then when they saw the finished work, um, you know, the, the bigwigs just thought there's no way this can happen. And there were two reasons for that. One was, you know, we're going to be very benevolent and paternal and say oh the BBC knows best and he knows best we can't show this traumatizing film to our population because there will be the risks of panic maybe even someone throwing themselves under a bus yeah. uh, we have to look after we the population we have to be 
generous and benevolent and we're going to protect them, so we're going to ban the film. But of course, the other um, argument is that the Home Office, I don't know if the Home Office directly said you will not show this, but the Home Office exerted pressure on the BBC because they thought if this film goes out, or the thinking was if this film goes out, it will completely undermine any argument for civil defence and, yeah. and therefore it will argue, undermine any argument for for having the, the nuclear deterrent. People will think, well, what's the bloody point? And so the Home Office, basically the Home Office were, were frightened, I think, of what the public reaction would be. So Peter Watkins um, suffered. He was told, no, this incredible film that you've made, of course, went on to win an Oscar, uh, was just subdued, just um, completely silenced by the BBC. But... I think he's had the last laugh in the end, of course, because it went on to give birth to Threads, which, of course, of, of, when the war game came out, it was one of the high points of tension in the Cold War, the early 60s, or the yeah, mid-60s. Yeah. Mid and then when Threads came out, that was another high point of tension in the early 80s, when we had Abel Archer going on and Reagan saber-rattling with his Star Wars programme, calling the Soviets evil, and, yeah. of course, being caught on camera saying that bombing begins in five minutes, that famous clip where he was caught on camera making a joke when the early 80s was the worst time possible to make those jokes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the film is magnificent for magnificent for what it did itself, but also for what it gave birth to and what it inspired in, in threads. And, of course, anyone who wanted to join CND was able to view the film. It was, it was, you, know, you could see it in a private screening. I don't know how legal those private screenings were. Well, the ban that the BBC put in didn't actually affect cinema showings of the of the film. So when I was doing my research about the to find the reviews, there's loads of little adverts, like some local little Odeon and it's got it on, rating X. All the reviews that I found are from the little papers where the, the little town cinema had them played. So I know right. there was no cinema banning. So a lot of people saw it um, who wanted to see it, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an interesting point because I suppose the banning of the film by the BBC would have helped buoy interest and, you know, umphed the cinema going mm. you know, to go and see it in the cinemas. So that's probably helped a little bit, but still it, it's not that kind of reach where you have three TV channels and, you know, the nation is sat down on a, a Friday, Saturday evening. That kind of captive audience doesn't exist anymore. Almost everyone in the country would have seen it. It would have been talked about on Monday morning at work. And then people would have gone, Christ, I need to go and see this in the cinema. I didn't see it on the TV. You've got to wonder, like, how many people, if this had you know, actually been broadcast, would have finally seen it and how impactful it would have been? Massively so, I think. Because it got shown in 1985, BBC's After the Bomb, like, series of programmes. And it's when they played Threads. They played it beforehand. And then they had a guy, like, talk you into Threads, like, a by, by a journalist. Um, but, yeah, so it didn't get shown until, like, 25 years later. And then I think... I think I remember watching Charlie Brooker's How TV Ruined Your Life. He talks about um, seeing um, like these sort of these sort of nuclear TV shows, and they've got a vox pop from a guy, probably on BBC News. Like, oh, did you watch Threads and the War Game last night? Did it affect you? He goes, Nah, I think Hollywood can do a better job. He's like, It's not very scary. Nah, nah, I've seen scarier things on 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 movies. And I'm like, Is that how like brain dead you are by this point that the nuclear war means nothing to you? It was such a an interesting little tidbit there but you know i don't know how you could have shown this and i think the, the bbc's reaction probably quite just even if it's wrong to sort of think that they sh they kept it away from people i think if you've shown this you might have had moral panic if they had withdrawn it because of you know concern for people's mental health that is understandable yeah. yes but giving in to pressure from the home office is is an absolutely unforgivable but yeah i can think they could have got round the you know, worry about how people will react to this by preempting it, as you said, with a nice sensible introduction from some scientists or maybe from Michael Aspel himself, some well-known yeah. face, you know, like the, the Terry Wogan of his day or something, someone everyone knew and recognised and trusted to just say, this is what we're going to show and this is what the message is, you know, almost like a like a, a trigger warning, I suppose, although not as yeah. trivial as that, you know, trigger warnings these days can apply to any old thing on Twitter. If they'd given it some proper introduction with a well-known and trusted face, then I think they could mm. then have got round the old, old grannies might throw themselves under a bus type of thing. Yeah. Even making people aware that it was a dramatic re re representation, that it, you know, yes, it's based in the real world, but it is just someone's script that they've written 
you know, yeah. it's, you know, maybe not all of it is 100% accurate. They could have put a big disclaimer out there. Well, they, mm-hmm. they could have explained that it wasn't inevitable. You know, this isn't yeah. an inevitable event. We can avoid this. Because it's not like Russia and the UK and America weren't talking with one another and all things like that. It's not like we were completely closed off states mm. at that time. You know, it's sort of. But yeah, you know, I think I think for for my my final like my closing thought of it that is I think it's still as relevant as it ever has been. You know, I hundred percent agree with Roger Ebert's review that they said they should put it up. They should put duvets up in every park and they should show it to everyone, like on the hour sort of thing. You know, I think there's room for it. I think it's a really powerful piece of cinema it's made me rethink the war movie genre in a way because i'm thinking you know actually these films can do some good and i think this film can do some good and still has its place you know and i think it's it was on bbc iplayer a few months ago i think they might have whipped it off during lockdown but before it was it was on iplayer it was up for a whole year on iplayer I, it was really interesting it was a quick little thing after we watched the movie i was sort of walking around my house really despondent the, the second day I, I said to Matt, I feel really bad today. And he was like, you've got, you've got disaster syndrome in a really small way, in a, in a sense, <laughs> yes. you know, cause I was just a bit, I was a bit like, nothing means anything anymore. Sort of like, woe is me thing. And I was listening to the radio and all those sort of like protect yourself, get vaccinated. We're all in this together. And I was like, Oh my God, you changed like three or four words. And it's like, don't worry about the fallout. <laughs> c- c- come and get your tins of food. You know, we'll get all through this together, protect and survive. And I'm like, God, that is just, it's so, close to you know the parallels of it are sort of they could still be felt and things like that you know i think that's probably why this movie for me is just so great yeah to, to go back again to threads uh, the director mick jackson had said to me that there's no you can't talk about threads or the working of course aging the, the film might look dated you know it might you know looking at it on screen oh it's very obviously an old film Mm. But what doesn't date is what that thermonuclear weapon can do to you. It's the same now as it was then. That yeah. doesn't change. Yeah. We're just made of flesh and bone. <laughs> yeah. <It's> changed. <laughs> you know, Matt, have you got any final thoughts? Well, it is as relevant as it ever was because, you, you know, we've recently begun discussing about replacing Trident and increasing our stockpile of nuclear uh, warheads. Uh, the Russia-US arms race is essentially back on. You know, the developing hypersonic missiles and the, the developing new ICBMs. So that Great. threat of nuclear war is still there. It's, yeah. you know, and it, it hasn't gone away. It's sort of, we had a bit of a lull after the, you know, the collapse of uh, the Soviet Union. Um, but those sort of global superpower tensions, they seem to be bubbling again. You know, mm. America's very worried about China. So, yeah, I agree. I, I think... Julian and Mick Jackson are are right that it doesn't age. Yeah. The information that they're imparting may be slightly off scientifically and things may be updated, but the basic gist of what would happen and how it would happen and what the effects of it happening would be are all still super relevant. Massively. And Watkins, the way he delivers it, be it either through his writing or his cinematography or the general gist that he wants to go across through that sort of pseudo documentary style of his it's very powerful and it completely gets across that idea of nuclear war is such a horrific thing that we you know we can't really comprehend or contemplate the impact that it would have Mm. and ken uh tynan of the of the observer is one of the uh reviewers that i found and he said it may be the most important film ever made which is mirrored by what other people said at the time and I think at the time he was right, and he probably still is right, because it's difficult to sort of imagine what the effect of watching this film in 1966 would have been. You know, would we have become a nation that pushed unilateral disarmament? Would we have become united around the I idea of, of um, you know, getting rid of the bomb? Because when you think about how many people were, were in that sort of caption, captive audience watching, you know, BBC One, BBC Two, ITV at the time, those three TV channels we had in the UK, probably like a third to half of the, the country would have seen it. Mm. CND's membership would have rocketed, you know, would have. I, I can't see how it wouldn't have done. It's such a powerful film. And yeah, I just, it's, I've seen it dozens of times now because I think I first saw it um when i was an undergrad doing doing that module i mentioned on nuclear history and it's 
always stayed with me. And Threads might be slightly more impactful because it has that jump that you know you mentioned, Julie, that you know shows us that f- you know, really bleak future. But I think the two sort of like sit together really well. They they tell similar stories, but Mick Jackson Threads tells a little bit more. Mm. But there's some bits that War Game sort of fills in within the Threads, so they kind of re- work really well together. I know it's been said a thousand times, but I do believe that all politicians should be made to watch it because they're those who've got a cavalier approach to nuclear weapons, like uh, Trump, for example. I think he said something early in his presidency along the lines of uh, we didn't know what the nuclear triad was, was it referred to, and I think he said something like, well, what's the point of having them if you can't use them? And that's probably, to me, that's the most the most frightening thing he's ever said. Everyone got upset about his comments about pussy grabbing. For me, that was, that was just, you could dismiss that as daft lads talk. That didn't bother me. What bothered me was this man doesn't recognise that the whole idea of nuclear weapons is that they're too horrific to be used. Yeah. So this cavalier attitude that I think maybe is going to creep in to the public discourse more and more, the further we get from the horror of the Second World War, yep. I think that could maybe be, we could help snuff that out mm. if we could make people, and we can't make people, but encourage people to watch these realistic films. Um, because even though, of course, the Cold War was terrifying, at least the, the guys in charge had direct experience of the horror of total war, or at least mm. they, they felt very close yeah. to it. Whereas now, I think Western society were a bit perhaps too privileged and warm and cosy and doing all right. Yeah, we feel yeah. Have, we're not close to that absolute horror. And then um, things like Threads or The War Game or books like, if I can give a shout out to the sure. brilliant... Uh, Svetlana Alexeyevich, um, her oral histories of Soviet horror are the mm. most powerful books I've ever read. So yes. these things, almost like they're almost like time machines. They take us back to those horrors, which we're getting far too, in the West at least, far too distant from. And we're getting far too relaxed, basically. <laughs> I want us all to be a bit more anxious. Well, it's that whole thing that we, we, we say a lot on the podcast. It's film now um, more than ever can give you that key to unlock more of an interest so if you're not aware of nuclear war i would say or aware of the impact that it could have or can have and this is a perfect film to start your journey of learning as is you know if you watch a film about the second world war first world war 1917 men have kicked off a, a rejuvenation in learning about the great war why can't the war game and threads again from the 80s to now rejuvenate a learning and an understanding of why these weapons are so destructive um, and m- films have that power and it is out there it's readily available out there you can find it quite easily um, and the BBC should put it back on iPlayer um, certainly should so yeah and threads definitely 100% definitely. I mean I, I I wouldn't mind if they were shown in schools like yeah. within a proper context of a secondary school history lesson I think uh, a module or a course mm. of however it's worked now well changed. they show they show Schindler's List to to show yeah. the, the the horrors of the Holocaust, so why can't they show war game or threads to punctuate the Cold War era? You know, I, I don't know how key stages work these days, but I know. No, we, I don't have that. So I was thinking we skirted over the Cold War quite quickly. It was like, oh, Cuban Missile Crisis, Vietnam, done, and I was like, oh, okay. Sitting at the back of the class, knowing that's not the truth, I was like, <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. But um, yeah, but thanks very much, Julie, for coming on. It's been it's been fantastic. Thank when you. When can we expect your book, Julie? Uh, it's due with my publisher in July. Um, I remember <laughs> when I first got the book deal, I thought, oh, that's ages away. I've got all the time in the world. Yeah, and now I realise there's there's yeah. no time. There's no time at all. <laughs> um, so, but there's no point panicking. I have little studies of panic and then I just think there's no point panicking. Just sit down and get the bloody thing done. So it will be out next year. Once I've got a publication date, I'll be telling absolutely everyone about it. So. Well, in the meantime, everyone needs to check out uh, Julie's Atomic Hobo podcast. Yep. Um, we'll be putting out links, so be sure to check those out if you haven't already. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for coming on, Julie. It's been, a, I wouldn't say a pleasure talking about nuclear war, but I've, <laughs> I've definitely enjoyed um, discussing it yeah. with you guys. So It's been so insightful for me as a novice to the, to, to the effects of nuclear war, and it's been quite a cathartic experience these couple of weeks actually getting it off my brain and off my chest which has been quite good so thanks julie for that and i did really love your latest episode about law and order on the atomic hobo thought it was fantastic oh thank you thank you 
yeah so uh like subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening hit that notification bell or that notification button if there's one on your thing uh we have a website fightingonfilm.com please go over there and have a look you can also um uh, support us on patreon if you feel so inclined that's um fightingonfilm at patreon.com so uh this is robbie julie and matt saying bye-bye again and we'll catch you in the next one bye guys bye